but he didn't want to get up at 7 o'clock. Welcome back to the Wellness Wave. Thanks for tuning in this morning to ride the wave with us. Each week, our goal is to give you at least one suggestion that will make your life a little bit better. So uh, I'm here. Oh, I've got this. I've got to say this because my wife, Lori, is going to make me say this. Uh, everything we discuss in the show is for informational purposes only and should not be taken as medical advice. So uh, I'm really excited today because I'm here with my good friend, Dustin. And uh, with, with, with Dustin does basically, you do a lot of stuff, right? Yeah. But one of the things we want to talk about today is artificial intelligence. So can, okay, can you tell us a little bit what, what, the, what is artificial intelligence and uh, how does it work? Yeah, first off, super excited to be here. I mean, you and I can have <laughs> talked probably thousands of hours until now. Um, so we only got to squeeze it into a half an hour. And it's tough to talk about a topic like AI because it's new, but not new. I mean, we've said, people have said artificial intelligence for a while now, but so why has it changed? That's really, I think, at the, the kernel of, of the curiosity for people. And before it was something called machine learning. You would have a machine play chess for thousands of hours, and then eventually it figured out it, how to play chess, right? You would give it the rules. You would say, this is a win, this is a loss, go play a million games, and then it figures out through that process uh, how to win at chess and what is a good move, right? So that was machine learning. And eventually that got so good where you didn't have to give it so many parameters. You could give the computer less and less instruction and it could figure some stuff out. And now that's kind of the point where AI is at is that we've done all of this research and technology for machine learning, and now they're getting pretty good at that. So we're able to give it more stuff with less instruction and have it just go from there. Well, uh, let's, and people have probably heard about ChatGBT. So why don't we talk a little bit about ChatGBT? Sure, these technologies are called LLMs, or large language models. And what they are is a database of a lot of different phrases and text. It's, it's a mostly text content. Because when you chat with ChatGPT, you're typing something in, you're engaging with it in chat in a text format, and then it's going to spit something out in text format. So language is at the, the foundation of this technology. And it's large because it has a lot of information that's all in this like text uh, text format. So these technologies work in a similar way that our brain does. You know, and this is kind of making a claim where when I'm speaking, I don't have my whole, you know, three or four sentences planned out. My brain is kind of like laying the track for the train, you know, as we're going down and laying one word out in front of another. And these technologies will take your question and try to predict what is the best likely next string of words that would answer your question or um, continue on what you're saying. So it uses language and, and a lot of information to then engage with you with a question or a query from you and then predict what is the best likely string of words that would answer your question. Right, what I found, and I've been using this, and I'm gonna give you some kudos here, Dustin, because you're one of the first people front lines with the ChatGPT. You're the first person even told me about it, and you showed, showed my son Alex how to do it. So, I mean, you are, you are you're, you're cutting edge technology. I know you're good with that. What I found really interesting, I had, sitting in your chair um, a few weeks ago, a mic from Atlantic Athletics out, out here in Leicester, and you know, he's also a sponsor for my, for my TV show. So uh, I have sponsors for my TV show, and I want to make up like a one-minute, um, a one-minute uh, commercial for them. You know, whether it's you know, with, with Mike with Atlantic Athletics, I typed in there and I said, um, make uh, make me a one-minute commercial. So the ChatGPT was able to figure out exactly what a minute would be based on the words. Otherwise, I have to count each word. I have to go uh, and go in there with the whole thing. And they even will do with this chat, they'll put in like little sounds and stuff. It goes like, come down and see Atlantic Athletics. Then you hear, then it says, and uh, dumbbells hitting the floor. I mean, so they, they did all this stuff. 
But what I found fascinating and how fast this works is I say to it, and I've said this, uh, I also have Anna Maria College coming on board too. I, I said, make me a one minute, uh, a one minute promo for uh, Atlantic Athletics, Anna Maria College from their website, from all the information on the website. It's like 10 seconds, not even that. It, they, it went to their website, looked at their website like that, pulled all that information out of there, put it into a format that people would like to hear with the sounds and everything else, and then it spit it out. So now, that would have taken me, I don't know how long, Dustin, for me to sit down, because you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna write it down, I, I have to go to their website, I have to things down, I have to go here, here, and there, then I have to figure out what's a good way to put it. It's like most five minutes, at the most, and it's, 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 it's basically done. Then I send it over to my advertiser and I say, this is what I came up with from ChatGPT. Make any changes you want. Zip, zip, zip. Then I do that. I can change it also because we do a one minute ad for them and a 30 second ad for them. Now take this format, change it into a 30 second, like instantaneous. So this is uh, amazing, amazing stuff. I mean, and we talked, it's funny, I was mentioning, we should record this stuff before the show does send. For sure. <laughs> Everybody having the show, we wound up talking, even, um, even with, with my uh, radio show, we talked a half hour before the show, and a lot of stuff, the pre-show is better than the real show, you know what I mean? Because, you know, you're just talking, to, you know, you're just, you're just freelancing off of the whole thing. So, for one thing, it's made, it's made my life, uh, my work life, so much more, more efficient, and that's what we talked about. And the other thing we talked, again, before the show was, it's also going to replace a lot of jobs. You want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, and I think it's really on the forefront of everybody's mind, right? Because um, it's finally going to affect a, a lot of people. You know, I don't think people um, complained a lot when the, the tractor replaced a lot of farmers, you know? But now it's coming after, like, a lot of white-collar, you know, middle management kind of positions that, in entry-level data entry positions, where, you know, in your example of how you're using it, it's perfect for the mundane. It's perfect for the things that either take more mental, uh, mental energy or mundane tasks that you really don't want to do. And that ends up being a lot of what makes up jobs. Um, you know, if you think about an office back in the 50s, there was a lot, it was all typewriters and you needed a lot of secretaries to move a lot of memos around a building, physical paper, right? And now you, don't, you need one secretary with access to an email account and they can do the work of, you know, and it, it's like been the, the progression, right? Like this is, I'm just making the, stating that it's not a new thing. Like this has been the progression and that this technology adapted really quick and now it's gonna make a lot of changes, I think even quicker than, than uh, the pace we're used to. But, the important thing I think to keep in mind is that it's not going to replace people. Like this technology is not really there yet to full on replace somebody. However, professionals who use it will replace professionals who do not by sheer efficiency and level of productivity. If someone in a specific job role is used to using these tools and can now do the work of three or four people, it just makes sense from the business side to, okay, well, thank you for your work until this time, you know, try to find other positions for those people, but those are going to be less and less likely to happen. And you've got one person doing the work of, you know, at least two other people. Um, and that's happened within my company and the companies that I help where we immediately come in and start automating the admin tasks. All the things that, how many hours a week are you and your team spending copying and pasting? Immediately addressing those saves, I mean, on average, 10, 20 hours a week, you know, on the low end, depending on the size of the organization. And so just all of that time really stacks up over the course of a year and, and years after that, where what used to take a team, you know, 40 hours can now be done in, in 20, you're able to either do more in that, in that week, uh, and, and that just, it just stacks up and is cumulative over time. And so it's got people excited on, from the business side. People are excited that they, have, they don't have to spend as much money. <laughs> and so 
that's really a, where a lot of this influence is, is coming from, from the top down. Um, and I, I think it's important for people in those positions to be engaging with these tools um, so they can increase their own, their own productivity. And, and in the meantime, before somebody comes and axes their position, if that's as bad as it can get, is that it makes their job a little easier in the meantime. Um, and so I think you know, to address maybe an objection right away where people say, okay, well, what if we don't engage with these tools then and we don't help the, the organizations improve efficiency? Um, let's let's uh, boycott or, or resist kind of this change. Um, I, I think that that's only a short-term solution. I think the genie's out the bottle with this stuff. And just between GPT-3, 3.5, 4, and GPT-5 is rumored to come out this summer, it has made monumental improvements at each iteration. And that pace is only increasing. It's only accelerating. And I think now is probably the, there's never going to be a better time to engage with this technology. It's only going to get uh, faster and, and more difficult too. And correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding too is actually now with this AI, it's learning from itself. Is that true? Is it kind of learning? It's kind of like it's seeing what it already knows and it's kind of building on what I heard. I heard a bunch of different not, not yet. I heard a bunch of different podcasts. They were just saying uh, basically right now it, it can go out and it can look around at other stuff on its own and say, okay, I'm going to make myself better. That's not happening? Not exactly. So okay. there's still data engineers behind all of these models determining what gets fed into the large language model. And I don't know what's happening behind the scenes at Google and OpenAI and, and Anthropic and these large language model designers, but there's a reason why when you query ChatGPT, it says, we can't search anything past 2022, you know, um, or 2023, is because they, we don't know the effect of feeding these AI models their own information. Um, we haven't done enough testing on that. And so I know that ChatGPT, there was an article they put out about like a text watermark where they're able to determine if something was produced by GPT-4 so then they can weed it out from the model. And there are certain technologies like originality.ai that their whole job is to determine was this produced by AI or not. So you know, the technology has advanced where we are keeping track of what's AI produced and making sure it's not fed back into the model. Um, are they experimenting with that behind the scenes? Maybe, but all public models, as far as we know, um, has not been fed its own information to learn from. And we, and we were even uh, speaking before the show, uh, I think it was on 60 Minutes on Sunday morning, we were talking about there's a big shortage of therapists right now. There's a big mm -hmm. mental health issue going on here. So a bunch of uh, psychiatrists got together and, and formed this, this AI model where you're able to type in and, you know, type in stuff and, uh, you know, I'm depressed or this is bothering me. And basically the, uh, the AI would come back and, and talk to you. And uh, we, we talked a little bit about this before the show. It, it was called a closed model. So in other words, it, it, it was, wasn't uh, mm -hmm. open to, to everything. It was just... It would only, whatever you put in, it was a, a set answer was, was put back to them. And that worked for a while, but then they sold it to another company, but then the company opened it up to, to, to open AI. And they were finding out that some of the stuff coming in that they didn't want, and they, they thought that could have been, that could have been a, little bit, a little bit of a problem. Can you explain the difference between the closed AI and the open AI? Uh, yes, and that's a, a, a perfect topic. To, it's a very important topic to bring up. So... The, the overall term is open source technology. So if you think about something we're familiar with, like Apple and Microsoft uh, operating systems. So you know like a Mac and a Windows computer are two separate operating systems. There's actually another one called Linux. Have you ever heard of that For one? sure, yeah. Linux is open source, which means anybody in the world has access to that operating system's code and can make changes and... There's like a community of people for free that upkeep and update this operating system where Apple and Mac and Windows and Microsoft, they, it's closed 
uh, software, so only those engineers can make that software better, right? With these large language models, OpenAI is the name of the, of the organization, but it is very much closed. That is not open source technology at all. Um, and there are some open source large language models, but they're not as easy to engage with as ChatGPT. Um, and so it's, it's really calling into question like who owns this stuff and like the power behind this kind of data and, and understanding. Um, and should we be using these open source models for this technology or closed and, and et cetera? And I think it's important for people engaging with this technology. Let's just take ChatGPT because that's the one, I, that's the one I recommend people probably start with um, because it's easiest to find online. It's the one most people are talking about. You should probably start there. If you are asking it a question, you log in, you make a free account. It says GPT 3.5 up in the left-hand corner and you ask it a question. OpenAI has access to that. That is being added to their pool to pull from to learn from. If it is you pay for the pro version for four, you uh, still, anything you engage with that chat goes to OpenAI and they technically own it, okay? If you use the API, so if you're developing software that engages with that as like a back end, let's say you're making a chat bot, anything engaging with the API, not added to the model to learn from. And they recently, because there were some uh, programmers at Boeing that got in trouble. They were using ChatGPT to code, but they were just engaging with the chat and they were putting proprietary code oh. into this. And so it's like, okay, well now OpenAI now owns our proprietary code, oh. like you guys are fired. So ChatGPT came out with a Teams account and that's like uh, 25 bucks a seat, $50 minimum. So it's a little bit more expensive. But the benefit is it's private. So anything you engage with the chat under a team account, it's now private and not added to the model. So it's important for people to understand that don't give it, you know, all of your personal data. Don't give it, you know, um, your blood type and, and things like that. Just engage with it to help with some mundane admin tasks. And if you want it to engage with some more personal information, maybe pay for um, the privacy. It kind of reminds me a little about those different search engines like you know Google and DuckDuckGo. Go. Mm -hmm. And yeah. uh, that's the whole thing with, with Duck, is it DuckDuckGo? Yeah, DuckDuckGo. Go. Yeah. And they'd, in other words, if you go on Google, you, you type in a hat, you get a thousand ads for hats. Mm -hmm. Everything's about hats. Where, and they, they kind of know obviously, well, obviously what you're doing. That doesn't necessarily bother me that much because if I'm looking for a hat, I don't mind getting hit, hit with yeah. a bunch of, but they, Duck, Duck, a ghost says basically, we're not gonna, we're not gonna follow you. We're not, we're not gonna share your information. The other thing, uh, again, before the show, we were talking about uh, which jobs they can, this can help, which can replace. And we were talking before about lawyers. To me, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, law, lawyers would be the easiest, especially legal secretaries. Because my wife's a lawyer, and when she when she went to had to pass her, her bar exam, you have to you know with this case back in 1925, what's what's the case law on this? What's, so it's a tremendous amount of memorization on there, and you have a legal secretary, so uh, you you you, get, you wind up getting sued, hopefully not, and you have to hire a lawyer, and they say we're suing you because of X, Y, and Z. Then the lawyer hires and gets the legal secretary, lists all these laws related to copyright infringement, whatever, whatever thing you want. They go through all the books, this, this, and this. Chat GPT almost instantly can pull that stuff out. All, he has access to all, not only the previous case law, all the brand new case law, because all law is based on, on precedent, right? What happened before. So why do you have to pay a legal secretary, you know, 30, 40 bucks an hour and have her go through all of these, you know, books across here to basically do it? Well, you can just type it in, give me examples of all the case law based on this particular case. And, I don't, and lawyers make big bucks, three, four hundred dollars an hour. I don't know what legal secretaries make, but I see this as one of the easiest ways to, re, uh, and obviously, and then you get somebody that's really good at maybe going before a jury and a judge. He, has, he or she has all that information already, just has to stand up 
and has all the information in front of it. I suppose the thousands. And you know, Dustin, they bill you, was it per minute? <laughs> yeah, six minutes. <laughs> oh, yeah, I know. <laughs> Point one. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. But it's like a taxi cab, right? <laughs> the, meter's, mm -hmm. the, meter's, the meter's running. So you could run up a huge legal bill uh, with that. So I see uh, basically lawyers as being really easy to replace, you know. So what, what does Shakespeare say? Uh, kill all the lawyers first. <laughs> that's some expression, <laughs> some expression like that. So uh, th that's one thing, L lawyers. The other one I'm thinking about in terms of, I was contacted actually at one time uh, 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 to write a book and, you know, write a book about, but now, AI is so good at writing books. I mean, it's amazing. So you can write you know, anything. But I see that as replacing ghostwriters too. Mm. So maybe I'm lousy at words and stuff like that. If I have a general idea of what I did in my life, I type the stuff up, pop it into AI, right? It, 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 you know, in the style of Shakespeare, right? Or in the style mm. of Stephen King, right? Or whatever like that. And they'd be able to do that to be able to, so I don't even know that much of, of, uh, of use in a ghostwriter. So it depends on, in both of these cases, ghostwriters and lawyers, you mentioned it before before we started talking to garbage in, garbage out, right? And that happens in, in two ways. The data that it's given, garbage data, garbage out, and engaging with it, the garbage prompt, you're not going to get that great of a response, right? So with a lawyer, in the same way with a psychiatrist that you mentioned before, you're always going to need a human in those roles because in, in law, you need empathy. You need to take into a lot of human elements that this technology is certainly not nowhere near there yet. If they do in 20 years, maybe that's a weird feature to think about. But as of right now, you need a person, right? And in the case of a lawyer, if you go ask ChatGPT, hey, write up a lease agreement, it'll do something like you know it'll be better than probably what you can come up with or what you can get from rocket lawyer or something you know but it doesn't have access to lexus nexus like ChatGPT doesn't have access to all of that uh those cases and most most lawyers have a program that they pay for that has every case and information about it and they can go query and it's just like a like a control f kind of go find this string and then it brings up all the different cases and you have to go and read them all. The second LexisNexis adds an AI element and that's gonna help lawyers, that's gonna be great. And then I think, I mean, like I'm making some, like some guesses here, but LexisNexis owns the biggest database of cases. They'll, it's easy for them to add an AI element that gives all of that as a knowledge database that allows lawyers to engage with it through text. Hey, I have this case. What do you think about this? Provide the list of cases you think. Then after a couple of years of lawyers helping build that model, they're just going to make it so you can log in and, you know, log in and, and ask it general lawyer questions. And then maybe even have access to a bunch of realtors. The same thing that happened with Zillow, where you would go to a realtor because they know MLS and they know the market and all that stuff. And then you, you were kind of like, uh, bottleneck by, by a realtor, sorry, realtors, you know, where now you can go to Zillow, which has every home that's on the market. It's the first place it goes. And then it has, oh, you need a realtor? Well, here's all of our approved realtors that pay us, you know, and, and I kind of see maybe a similar thing would happen in the space of, of lawyers. But same thing with realtors. It's somebody's biggest purchase that they're making in their lives and they need a human element to guide them through that. And it'll be that way with doctors and, and customer service representatives and all of these people. There's, there's never going, I don't think we're going to remove the human element of people doing business with one another or helping one another, but there's going to be this foundation of technology making it a lot easier. Right. Uh, the other thing we talked about, and actually I talk, was talking to a, a physician just the other day and it was interesting because he's looking to put this AI into his system to where uh, what happens when a patient writes something, AI could pick it up, and if, if it's a simple response, they can just respond. So he doesn't have to go in there and type it. The other thing that I see, and I talk to, I talk to a, lot of, a lot of medical professionals, this I see as a huge, huge game changer for, for the medical profession. 
Uh, you remember the old Watts and the IBM thing? Mm -hmm. You know, that was, that was one of the first ones when they were using it back then with medicine. Because what happens, especially now, if anybody's been to the emergency room or doctors, the wait is incredible. Mm -hmm. you're, you're in there forever, okay? And the, and the doctors, nurses, they're overworked, uh, seeing patients, stuff like that. Uh, what I found is, as you know me, I'm crazy. So I'm up at 3 in the morning. I'm re reading research papers. I'm reading this, this, and this. Doctor, nurse doesn't have time to do that. They're working X, X amount of hours. They're home with their the family. They're not going to go home and look at the latest research. They don't have time to do that. So a lot of them, and I found, uh, nothing against, because I love doctors, love nurses, they don't have time to keep up in the, the latest research. They just don't. So this is kind of hobby for me. I keep, I keep up on it. In fact, when I have medical professionals on my show, I've learned from my mistakes. I give them the questions ahead of time, <laughs> ahead of time, because a lot of times they just they haven't heard of this. Well, this this has been debunked, or this has been you know this has been disproven. So I get I want I don't want to embarrass them and ask them a question that they don't know. Yeah. So th that's what I do. But what I see is this, Dustin. I see uh, again in in real time with this artificial intelligence. They know every disease bird flu running around here. They know how many cases has been seen next door to you. Maybe this person came in with this particular rash and now it's Lyme disease and these are all the things. So when you see the doctor and they do the lab work, the AI, instead of the doctor looking at each every lab work and putting it together, the AI is going to put, put all take the, the most likely case is this. This is probably what it is. This is, this is probability one, this is probability two, this is probability three. One of my jobs when I worked in the hospital as a clinical biochemist, my job description was, I was to consult with the physician. I would look at the lab work, I do all the lab work, I put it in and I go to the doctor and say, based on this lab work, this is what I think the most likely thing is. And then he, you know, obviously he or she makes a decision, they do, they do the exam and they say, oh yeah, that, make, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, we talked a little bit about strep throat. So if somebody comes in with sore throat, uh, what happens, there's a test called the streptex. All it is, it's called a serology test. I would uh, swab your throat, I put it in there, and if it changes a certain color, bingo, you got, you got strep throat. I say that the doc, doc, this person's got strep throat, or this person's got this. I mean, you know, they have to make their own decision, but it was, it's, it's kind of a collaboration. So there's one thing in medicine, uh, it's called rule out. <laughs> They come in, okay, let's rule out this, let's rule out that, let's rule out that. So then you get down to more like, but AI can do that so much quicker. Mm. All the lab work, so in other words, what happens? I'm typing in all the lab results. It's going into a centralized computer. This is what I envision. And it looks at there. Uh, the doctor puts in his notes, you know, and, you know, we have a little bit of palpitation here. This is a little bit soft. It puts out the more, 99% the probability that you've got appendicitis. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? And then the doctor has to make his or her decision what right. are there. But it's going to eliminate, it's going to eliminate, okay, uh, I have a trivia question for you. Are you ready for this? Okay, what's the, uh, what's the number one cause of death in America? Heart disease? Okay. Uh, and uh, and what's, what's number two? Cancer. Okay. Everybody says that. They found out the actual, the actual number one cause of death in America is medical error. Mm, I thought you were going to say old age. I thought I was going to say it's, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, med it's, it's medical error. Mm. Because what happens is they found out either you, uh, it's a misdiagnosis. Oh, that lump's nothing. It turns out you have cancer, but three years later you die from cancer. So it's basically the number one cause is medical error. And again, uh, you know, I love doctors and everything else, but people make mistakes. You know? But again, they're overworked. They're this, this, and this. But I see with this, with this, uh, with this AI of just making things so much, you know, just so much better uh, because again, it's going to eliminate so many of these errors. We talked about radiology. Uh, computers much better at looking at breast cancer than a, than a doctor is. Again, we go the, the prob 99 probability this isn't cancer. Or they, they break it down. Then the physician can make their decision in terms of of what they think. You don't, you're not eliminating, eliminating that. So we have about a, a minute left on the show. So uh, tell us about uh, your, what Kingside, tell us what, what Kingside does. So Kingside is an AI automation agency. We help businesses to automate those mundane processes. We started as a web business, so we can do logos, you know, really elevate a business's online presence with branding, logos, a new website, 
Uh, we help them generate more leads, and when those leads come in the door, we make sure that they are easily handled by um, some AI-assisted systems that supercharge your admin. That's that's really who we help. And again, I've known I've known I've known Dustin forever, and I can't recommend him enough. In fact, my wife, my wife, the lawyer, uh, and her, her 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 brother, calling Dustin all the time. So even if you don't need a big, big job done, mm -hmm. you, you just, you know, if you're not that tech savvy and you need something, you know, g give Dustin a call. Uh, what I love about Dustin, he is so patient. He's so patient. Go here and look up the left or upper right-hand corner. So he, he's helped me a lot, too, with, with the, in terms of, of, my, of, of with the different things that I'm doing. So anything you need, just or uh, email me, philgeorge at charter.net, and I'll shoot it over. I'll shoot it over to Dustin. And uh, again, Dustin can help you out. Uh, great with websites, uh, basically pretty much great with any, any type of technology. Or if you want to upgrade, like me, learn how to use Chat Chat GPT a little bit better. Um, Dustin, D Dustin is, is the guy is the guy to say. Thank you for the kind words. Okay. So um, if you want to learn out more, uh, check out my uh, my TV station, uh, uh, Wellness Wave Radio on w WCRN. Uh, we have a, we have a lot of guests. We have a lot of we have a lot of medical professionals. Or if you want to come on the show and sit over here and share your information, you have a business like uh, just, just just like with uh, you're with the the gym the gym in Westboro, and uh, you can come on or we can we can have a chat. You can you can promote your business. Or if you want to just come on and share your journey, in terms of exactly you know what's happened with you, your health journey, things like that. So we'll uh, see you next week. And Dustin, thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me. Okay. Paul. Okay, bye guys. One of the most common questions I'm asked as a biochemist and health coach is what are the best supplements to take? Choosing supplements is a tricky business. Many companies have poor quality control and questionable ingredients. In the past, I had to send clients to several different websites. I am now able to offer one-stop shopping for all the quality brands I recommend with no shipping cost and a lower price in most cases. Just email me, philgeorge at charter.net for a free consult.